this is the class that Ted Russell is going to present as my audience, and I'm just focusing on the rim. So let's see if I can get this to capture the slides. Hopefully that thing won't fall over. If it doesn't fall over, I'm in business. But uh, because it's really just kind of tottering there. But the lesson that I'm going to present today has to do with transformation. Transformation? What does that have to do with anything? How is it relevant today? And, uh, <laughs> and how is it biblically specific to what it is that we need? And transformation has to do with what happens to a, an individual once they actually accept the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. And the Holy Spirit comes to indwell them. And you say, well... Yeah, that's all nice and good, but that's kind of esoteric. How does it really apply, and what does it really mean to be transformed? What is that transformation that we're talking about? And so what I want to do is just kind of show you a, a little video that will give you an idea of something that God has in his wonder so marvelously put into practice uh, through his creation. And I want to show you what happens in terms of metamorphosis. And this shows a, a caterpillar as it's changing from its natural state as a caterpillar, totally transforming into a separate state. And that separate state is becoming a butterfly. And in a way, it shows God's wonder in the process of how he and nature works with his creation. And we are his creation. And fundamentally, we become just as transformed throughout life as we begin to grow with him and become more like Christ. And so this just, in a very quick snapshot, shows, you know, a very sped up evolution of a, a caterpillar turning into a butterfly. And uh, even though it takes about 10 days, you know, to come out of the pupa, we see it in a lot shorter period of time. So, I stop that, and uh, so it gives you an idea because, and the reason I use that video is because it shows uh, through the process, it's called metamorphosis, and it's that total transformation that happens uh, to something when it changes from one state to another, and that's what happens to us in Romans 12 too. what happened to my... Oh, there it is. And uh, that's what happens to us when we come into a relationship with Jesus Christ, is that that should be occurring in our lives. And so we're looking at a transformation that happened. It happens uh, through Romans 12, 1 and 2. Uh, and that's the text that I'm going to be using in this lesson. Also, I just want you to know that I'm very open to making sure that you all feel comfortable with what I'm teaching and that it applies to you. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, feel free to jump in. Or if you have something you want to contribute, just feel free to jump in because, I mean, we all learn together. And if we're not all involved in it, you're just going to walk away and say, yeah, that Ted, he's, <laughs> he's just a guy that, man, he had to get this out of the way, so let's just get it out of the way. But some of the points that I think we want to gather as we get through this have to do with the objectives or aims as they're called. And we can see that we have the first cognitive objective that I want to try to get across as we're going. In other words, yeah, there is a certain amount of narrative that I've got to give. But the student will be able to contrast and differentiate the aspects of self-discipline against spiritual discipline as it applies to the transformation Paul is referring to to the believer. Additionally, a student will be able to distinguish the work required through personal motivation versus that of the Holy Spirit's discipline. So we're looking at God doing the work in us through his Holy Spirit. And that's where we really need to focus and see what it is that Paul's trying to bring out in this. The affective or the hands-on objective is that the student will describe how the scripture passage changed uh, their lives and will continue to change their lives. Identity and relate how the different disciplines affected heart-changing character values and attitudes in your life associating the changes to Jesus' character. So, I mean, there has to be something that results 
from knowing what it is that's happening here with this verse or these verses and how they apply to us and what God requires of us as we grow and mature in him. Then we have the psychomotor or the hands objective or the heart objective. The student will show how this transformation resulted in good works through a volunteer opportunity at a church body ministry. In other words, how did you change? What's something that you will do now that you didn't do before? Okay. And further, the student will explain any other Holy Spirit promptings and action they feel called that falls into the will of God. So there will be a change in a person that does accept the Lord Jesus Christ because there will be a heart change, a transformation. And uh, so as we go through it, we're going to kind of hit on some of these questions. How does such a drastic transformation apply to us? You know, I mean, yes, we're all individuals, we're all different, but how does this apply to each of us? And what are, what are we shedding? In other words, like, the, like the, when the butterfly's coming out, it shed the pupa that was on it, right? And uh, what are we being transformed into? Why, and why do we need to change? What's the change that's going on? Do we do it alone? Do we do it with others? How do we go about carrying this out? And how long does the transformation take? So if you have any questions that you want to add to that, feel free you know, just to say, hey, man, I think there's more to that than that. So Romans 12, 1 and 2, I'm going to give, although that's your NASB version, you know, it says, you know, uh, that what, what we're looking at is that, um, therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present yourselves a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, that's the NASB version. I said the King James Version because I'm older, and that's the Bible that was out when I was around. Now I'm almost gone, so now they got new ones out. But uh, that, that scripture puts it in perspective, I mean, I think really clearly, and encapsulate just about the whole good news message. I mean, once we come into a relationship with Jesus Christ, we're no longer conformed to this world. We have a new, uh, you know, citizenship. We have our citizenship in heaven. And we are to live that out in the way God would have it live it out. And we live it out in accordance with becoming more like Christ, right? So that's what the will of the Father is, is that we be conformed to the image of his Son. So I'm going to go in and talk a little bit about uh, who is the writer of Romans. It was Paul. And some say, well, who's Paul? Well, he first was known as Saul. He was a Pharisee. He was a Jew. Of the Jews is what he called himself because he was really zealous for God. But he was misdirected because he was following the Pharisaical way. And so it was Jesus that had to get his attention when he was on the road to Damascus, ready to go kill Christians because he felt that they were detracting from what God truly wanted in his people. So he was going to go get those people, bring them back, and they were going to try them, and probably many of them killed in the process if they didn't give up the way, which was what following Jesus was called, the way. So on, on the road, Jesus got his attention, and he basically came and revealed himself in front while he was on his horse. And he, he got blinded, and the other people heard things going on, but they didn't understand what was going on, but he did. Jesus told them. And so they took him to Damascus. After three days, you know, the prophet uh, Ananias came to him and said, hey, you know, God wants you to do a certain thing. You know, you basically gave him his commission. You know, and he's going to have to, uh, Jesus told Ananias that he was going to have to suffer much for his name's sake. But Paul became a very strong advocate for the Lord Jesus Christ and the good news. And he went to the Gentiles. That was who you know, the Lord had pretty much sent him out to, and he felt he was an apostle just like any of the other 12 apostles that Jesus selected directly, and he got selected, you know, on the road to Damascus. So he saw himself as that apostle. Well, he did. He showed a great amount of uh, veracity in going and teaching the Gentiles about Jesus. Now, he always hit the Jews first through the synagogues that he went to, but most of the time, the Jews pretty much, you know, kept him at arm's length and said, oh, we don't want anything to do with you. And so he said, okay, that's on you. And he would go then to the Gentiles and preach to the Gentiles. And he's the one that pretty much single-handedly began 
all of Christianity throughout the, the rest of the world, as Acts 1.8 says, into the end, unto the ends of the world. And so that's what we see as he presents his letter to the Romans. And so he wrote to the Romans just to kind of give them an intro of who he was and that he would be coming. So I believe he wrote it somewhere around the end of 50 AD to 60, uh, beginning of 60 AD, before he got put in jail, basically in Caesarea, and before he ended up going on the, the ship that got, you know, uh, went, got taken in the storm all the way to Malta. Because then he ended up in Rome, but he ended up in jail, right? So that was the issue. That's, that's who Paul is. So he's well qualified to be able to address this issue because he's experienced it himself. He had to be transformed from his old pharisaical way into a life of Christ, which is totally different, a life of grace, right? So in the process then, what we look at is that he admonishes those brethren, the ones that are already in Christ, and he's telling them that we need to know what God's will is for each and every one of our lives. If we don't understand God's will for our life, then we're, we're going to be working in the dark. And that's what God called us out of, was come out of the dark into light. So he's, as if he's addressing them in the sense that they need to be functional for him and to be able to go and address what their, what their beliefs are and their truths are to the rest of the people around them, that they are different, that they have a message to bring, and that God is the one that and ends up knowing what it is that he wants for you, and then you need to follow God's will in the process. So as, as we go through this, you say, okay, well, that's all nice and good. Okay, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. That's how it applies to me. He obviously has come into my life through his Holy Spirit, and God's always with me. He's, he's always right there beside me. I'm never any further from him than he ever is. I mean, we're the ones that may say something like that. Where does God go? Even as David would pray in the Psalms, where are you, Lord? Why are you so far from me? Well, he was never far. He's always right there with me. The issue is, where are you? And so what he's doing in the process is he's trying to get people focused on just being centered on Jesus Christ. And so by being focused on Jesus Christ, the question then becomes, who are you following? Are you following Jesus? Are you becoming like Jesus? Or are you following the world? And that's why verse 2 ends up stating, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now that applies today just as much as it applied then. Because there is a strong pull, especially here in the United States, hey, to satisfy self, right? It's all about looking out for number one. It's about, hey, what can I do to make sure that I've got a good retirement and everything? I'm not saying that those aren't wise things to have, but when they become more important than Christ, and following him, then you're still being conformed to this world and making it a priority over Jesus Christ. And that's what he wants us to change. He wants to be number one in our lives. Because if you go back and you look throughout the Gospels, it talks about, you know, when Jesus answered the lawyer. The lawyer asked, what's the most important commandment? He said, love God first and foremost with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then love your neighbor as yourself. If you can do those two things and carry them out, you you carried out the Old Testament requirements, in other words, the law and the prophets. You've done all that. So do you love the Lord that much to be able to say to the world, hey, you know, I know I have to live in the world, as John 17 says, but I don't have to become a central figure in the sense that it drives me. I follow Jesus Christ, and I take him in love to others. And so that's the transformation that we're talking about, and that the uh, and that the caterpillar video kind of showed is that we have to break away from our what we've been brought up in with our worldview and get out of that worldview and transform into what Christ wants us to be to become more like Him. The Bible is our guide to that. And but and when we come into community with other brothers and sisters in Christ, we grow together. And it's that integration that, like, if you ever watch a monarch butterfly uh, uh, hatching that happens and then they all turn into butterflies at the same time, I mean, they basically blot out the sky. That's how we should be as the body of Christ, coming together in unity 
I mean, to where we are, you know, the most pronounced thing in this world that is evil and that is under a curse, which Jesus broke most of it, you know, but we still have sin, right? But we have forgiveness and sin through Christ. So that transformation is that. Now, as we move on from there, the question is, well, but yeah, I understand that the Holy Spirit's in me. I understand I can read my Bible. I understand that I can pray. Those are good things, but is that all I need to transform? And uh, well, yes, it, those are essential. There's no question about it. We need to be in our Bible. We need to know for Psalm 119 tells us, Thy word have I hid in my heart, so I may not sin against thee. So there's a reason we need to be up to date on the Bible and know it. And then, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Both of those are in Psalm 119. So the Bible is, is essential in our development and our walk with the Lord. Then you say, well, okay, that's all nice and good. Why prayer? You know, I mean, usually I only pray when I'm in trouble, right? Uh, that seems to be it. Oh, help me, God. So... Um, well, yes, it's important, but how do you maintain relationship? Because that's what it's all about. It's about a relationship with Jesus Christ. How do you maintain relationship if you're not in communication with the person? You have to communicate. So prayer is our communication conduit, and we can tell him anything. We can, you know, ask him to forgive our sins. That's why he died for us. We can ask him, you know, pray for others. Uh, we can... Thank him for all that he does for us. We can thank him for the air and the water he provides because we need it every day. We can, you know, just talk to him. I mean, just like I'm here talking to you all, you can talk to him the same way. He wants to hear from you. Most of the time, you may not hear verbally or orally back from him in the same respect, but a lot of times you can feel his guidance, his direction, his, his pushing through the Holy Spirit in you. And so... That's why we need to be focused on him. Now, my recommendation is that there, there are many good books out there about spiritual disciplines. And you say, well, what are spiritual disciplines? Well, spiritual disciplines are those core values in the Bible that we focus on to be able to develop to become more like Christ. And so, as a matter of fact, prayer is one of them. Uh, Bible intake is another one. Uh, and Bible intake is more than just reading. It's study, it's meditation, it's memorization. It's, you know, it's all these things that apply the same with all of those issues that deal with uh, spiritual disciplines because that's what develop us. That's what make us into somebody, into the person that becomes more like Christ. So as we move ahead, um, there's a great book. Dallas Willard has a book called The, the Discipline or, or Spiritual Discipline and uh, the spirit of disciplines, and it develops you in turn, it shows you how to develop and through these spiritual disciplines. There are several books out there, all of them very good. Dallas Willard's is really good. So as we move on, that's what we look at and try to develop. Okay, so uh, that pretty much brings into focus what it is that I wanted to talk about, but I want you to know this is a pretty broad topic, so we're going to be talking about it over several weeks as we, you know, break it down into their component parts and looking at each individual area that we can develop to become more like Christ. And as we pursue that in the following weeks, we'll be able to put some of those into practice. We'll actually go out and carry out some of these. We may go out witnessing, for instance, to tell because evangelization is one of those disciplines that we need, for instance. We may need to go tell others. We need to actually get into a point where it's not just head knowledge, but that it's, it's heart knowledge and the ability to change and not be afraid, be bold, and go do what God calls us to do. So what we're looking at, again, is that transformation that we need in Jesus Christ. So are there any questions or comments? I, and there haven't been so far, but uh, anything that you guys want to contribute or add to this? Okay. Well, thank you, and uh, I look forward to being transformed with you as we go on this journey, and may God bless you. Thank you.